Hi, I'm Marianne Moenraj. I'm here at the World Fantasy Convention in Los Angeles 2019 um, for the Speculative Literature Foundation. And we're here interviewing Nala Hopkinson. She's the author of Brown Girl in the Ring, Midnight Robber, The Salt Roads, The New Moon's Arms, The Chaos, Sister Mind, those are all her novels, and then anthologies and collections such as Whispers from the Cotton Tree Root, uh, Skin Folk, Mojo Conjure Stories, So Long Been Dreaming, which is the post-colonial science fiction anthology, um, Falling in Love with Hominids, etc., and so on. So it's a very long list. Um, I've read almost all of it. I love them all. And uh, what I really wanted to ask Nella to talk about today is her use of language, um, which I think is exceptional. And it's something that as a writer, I struggle with a lot in my own work these days. I think especially as someone who has done both um, sort of literary fiction with a focus on prose and, is, uh, and language, and now recently have been writing, trying to write more commercial fiction and sometimes, um, and more genre fiction. And sometimes I find that when I am working with rocket ships or dragons um, and fast paced plots and um, lots of dialogue, I feel like I'm losing my hold on finely crafted language and, um, and beautiful speech. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something you do so well. So I was gonna ask you to uh, read the opening of Midnight Robber, um, which I've given her my phone, so it's now locked. There you go. <laughs> and then, uh, so I'm gonna ask her to read the opening of that, and then um, maybe we can just talk a little about how you approach that in your work. Okay. Um, so this is a mostly Trinidadian English vernacular uh, with a little bit occasionally of Jamaican and some bits of Ghanese thrown in. Um, and this is from the introduction. It had a woman, you see, a strong, hard black woman with skin like cocoa tea. She too put them tough from hiking through the Diablo bush, the Diablo bush on the prison planet of New Harper Tree. When she walked, she foot strike the had a book like breadfruit drop into the ground. She two arms hard with muscle from all the years of hacking parts through the diablo bush on new halfway tree. Even she hear itself rough and wiry. Long black nutty locks springing from she scalp and cork screwing all the way down she back. She named Tan Tan a new halfway tree which she planted. Thank you. Um, I know when I first read that, I was I was super struck by it. I love I love hearing you read it because um, I think initially I'm encountering as a reader a sort of a dialect I'm not familiar with, a way of speaking. It's maybe a little intimidating when you read it. I think it comes very clear, but even on the page, it doesn't take me very long to fall into the rhythms and to be able to follow. Um, so if maybe, I know you teach a few hours from here, you're at, um, at the University of California Riverside. At the University of California Riverside. So I don't know whether this is something you work on with your students, if you have approaches that you give them along this, or just how you think about it when you're working with language in these texts. Mm -hmm. now, first of all, I come out of a literary tradition uh, in the Caribbean of um, privileging uh, common speech. And that's a movement that started when my father, who was a, a poet, a playwright, an actor, um, was still alive. Um, and there's people like uh, Kamal Brathwaite, like uh, Louise Bennett Coverley, who were saying, we speak like this, it is not bad English. It has its, and linguists who are discovering it has its own grammar rules, it has its own logic. Um, and so there began a movement of writing the way people speak. So I already have permission, is what I'm saying. Um, and also, everybody's speech is beautiful. I mean, if you listen, just listen to people talking on the street where they're not, you know, trying to censor themselves for an English class, uh, they flow. Right. So one of the things I will do is put myself back in that space. I mean, my, my Caribbean English is middle class English. It still has its own stuff, but it's not as, uh, it, it's not as deep, it's not as basal -ectal. Um, Wait, I'm sorry, I don't know the word you just used. The, there's three words I've learned from linguistics, and they are acrolectal, mesolectal, basolectal. Okay. And it's a way of not getting into the trap of saying this is upper class speech, this is lower <laughs> class speech. Right. So they, they actually go to the center. Okay. It's uh, 
and they, they measure speech by how far it is from the center. Oh, that's super useful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So basolectal is, is, is sort of um, what we think of as working class, farming class, common speech. Okay. Uh, mesolectal is more like what you would get if from sort of white collar. Right. Um, and acrolectal is what we sometimes think of as BBC English. Um, so I have permission, is what mm. I'm saying, and I have the fortune of having grown up with a, an actor and a poet in the house. Um, and also you can hear language being used uh, uh, everywhere. You listen to, to hip hop, you listen to rap, you listen to um, uh, any sort of music that comes out of um, uh, an everyday tradition. Mm -hmm. And you can hear people using speech beautifully as working speech. So I try to tell my students to listen to themselves and to each other. Uh, and I mean, they're in class, so they think I, I want proper English. I'm right. like, have you read me? <laughs> <laughs> um, and this one thing I end up saying to my students often when they're writing papers mm -hmm. is, and they're, the writing in the pages is, is very stiff yeah. and very, very, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's missing words often. Yes. They, they lose verbs and so on. And I, I, remi I try to remind them, you speak beautifully in class, yes. right? When yeah. we're in conversation, Everyone can understand everything you say. You speak with passion and with, um, you know, emphasis, yeah. and that's all I want to see on the page. Yeah. Just Somehow they think you don't want that. Yeah. And I, you know, I said, well, you know, I don't actually want to be bored. <laughs> um, and sometimes, if I, I, sometimes I don't even understand what they're aiming for. They're trying so hard to make it, you know. Right. So I say, what were you trying to say? And they yeah. tell me. So right. I write, write, that, write down. that down. <laughs> I think I just had that conversation last week as we were revising papers. So. <laughs> and then um, we have to get out of the trap of thinking that it's bad language. Mm. Um, there is no language that is bad language. Uh, and all language is beautiful. I feel like... So I asked a question. You went in a direction that is actually now more interesting to me than my question. But I, I think I can connect them. So... So in the in the novel that I, I've recently been finished working on, I have some working class characters. I come from a middle upper middle class background, right? In fact, most a, a good half of my characters are working class, and they're in that community. Um, and it's not, and it's science fiction. It's at a hundred years from now, so I can't I can't exactly just like go and spend time in that community, mm -hmm. right? I have to imagine and invent it, yeah. and. I wonder, like, what would you suggest as a way for someone like me to do a better job of representing that? Um, would spending more time listening to working class voices now give me access? Is yes. That, does that, yes, right? Yes, uh, it would. Um, because then you know what you're extrapolating from. Right. But also, I, I asked uh, uh, Samuel R. Delaney when he was one of my teachers at Clarion, and I was working on this novel and struggling with how to put a whole novel in mm -hmm. and invent it, well, uh, cobble the hybrid vernacular. And he said a little of that goes a long way. Yeah. And I promptly proceeded to ignore him. But <laughs> <laughs> Tobias Pickel said something similar on a panel we were on at one point where he was talking about how he uses um, Caribbean speech patterns in his space opera series. And he, I think he said 10%. Right, yeah. like he tries to put in about ten percent of what you would actually hear in conversation, yes. and that's enough to to give people the sense of it without being a barrier to those who are completely yes. unfamiliar. Yes, yes, and I think that works and is what I will do uh, when I'm not trying to, you know, experiment with speech uh, in a whole novel. Well, and in Midnight Robber, you don't do the entire book in that either, right? You you, actually, you switch. I switch no, somewhat. I, I switch. Um, Valencies, like a switch, yeah. and you can. I sometimes it's a deeper register mm. than others, but I don't think I ever go to straight up uh, right. standard English. That's right. Um, but yeah, a little, a little bit of it, like uh, particular phrasings. Mm -hmm. I remember reading, I believe it's Emma Bowles. Um, it's a novel that's set on a university campus, uh, and there's a lot of Shakespearean English floating about. But she doesn't use a lot of it. She picks one or two phrases. I remember I Cry You Mercy shows up every so often. I know what you're thinking of. Yes. It's Pamela Dean. Oh, yeah. sorry. That's okay. Sorry, That's okay. Pamela. Only because I happen to love that book. It's Pam too. Lynn. Yes. And it's, yeah, it's, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, she does. A, and she does. She does a great job with those like little moments of Shakespearean yeah. English slipping yeah. in. Yeah, so you so. don't have to be an expert 
in, in that particular language right. form to write it. You have to know it well enough to pick some choice phrases yeah, yeah. Uh, and repeat those, and, and uh, that will give your readers the flavor. Um, you talked about the um, of tackling my book for the first time and not knowing the vernacular, but somehow getting the pattern. Mm -hmm. I've heard that book read in um, New Orleans working class French inflected English. I've heard it read in Ontario, Canada Farm Girl. I've heard it <laughs> read. <laughs> and people fall into whatever vernacular they're familiar with and it sort of fits. Yeah. So it's not as though the reader has to be an expert. They just have to understand that people speak in different ways. I use um, one text that I find is helpful for getting my students and myself into to pay attention to language a little bit is Ursula Le Guin's Staring the Craft. And the first sections she has um, you know, just these various exercises on um, sentence level work and she has these passage example passages and she has one by Twain um, uh, I think she may even use two examples by Twain one is the from the celebrated jumping frog of Calaveras County and I think what's interesting is I have the students and myself read these pieces out loud in class and even though I have actually spent almost no time in the south but when I read this work out loud it, it it puts me in these rhythms, yes. right? And yes. uh, you know, I, I almost have sort of a bad southern accent by the end of the piece, right? <laughs> yes. And like, then I want to keep talking like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. yes. um, yeah. And so I think I think the text, you know, there's this, there's maybe an anxiety that if I if I write like this, the reader will not be able to find their way in. But it's you're kind of teaching the reader how to read this. As, as they go, right? Or science fiction fantasy readers are used to learning the text as they, as they go. The, the thing that I do sometimes um, hear is people, they feel distance from it because they, they say, why would you want to write in bad English? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, in the UK and the US, there are, there are traditions of writing of the way people speak, but uh, I have a former student who's teaching English in Korea and he tried teaching this novel. Mm -hmm. I mean, he managed, but um, <laughs> they don't have a, a similar tradition, so students couldn't understand right. why a writer wouldn't want to prove that she could manipulate language right. in the standard form. Um, so you get that, that contempt, or people thinking I'm trying to express contempt for the characters. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. I, there's a, a short story, um, you know, the Gifford Grapevine, it's in, in Dark Matter, yes, right? Yes, Charles yes. Chestnut, yes. where he switches registers between very, very formal standard English and um, and the, the language spoken by the black slaves on the plantation, mm -hmm. right? And if I'm remembering right, it was one of the first published short stories in America by a black man, and he encountered a lot of resistance from people mm -hmm. who didn't didn't want to believe he wrote it mm -hmm. um, that he could write it and I thought it was it was a, an interesting choice to have like here I will prove to you that I can do standard English yes. and um, then put the best lines and the joke of the story the point of the story in this other voice yes, yes. and you're gonna have to follow me there to yes, get it right yes. and it's um, it, it, it also reminds me of um, uh, Borderlands La Frontera by Gloria Anzaldúa, which she writes in this in Tex Mex, and again is is this almost a demand that you know if I'm not going to make this, I'm not going to translate this for you. Mm -hmm. You come to me, right? Yes, yeah, and, uh, yeah. And, and that it, is another question: is how do you represent it on the page? Yeah. So in the Book of Grapevine, there's lots of you know apostrophes and leaving the right. ends off things, and that that's fine. That's the way he did it. I don't. Yeah. I write in as much as I can in standard English spelling. Right. Oh, that's but interesting. But I keep the the, 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 um, the rhythms and the vocabulary. Yeah. Uh, it gets. It's mostly not that hard to do, except you get some words that just aren't translatable. There's the Jamaican word maga, which mm. means uh, skinny, like skinny, too skinny, um, and of course comes from meager. But you put down meager, it's just not going to work. It doesn't have to you, you feel gotta, right. Yeah, you have to somehow come up mm -hmm. with a spelling for maga which means some readers won't get it unless you're very careful about how you put it in context. Uh, and I, I, I find I don't worry too much about those readers. <laughs> <laughs> There's Google. <laughs> There's Google, right? They'll yeah. get there. Yeah. Um, the Bone People is one of my favorite books, and she just puts all the Maori in there, and you cope, yes. right? She's, yeah. and, you, and she gives you enough in standard English 
that you can follow even if you don't look up any of the Maori. Yes. Um, if you do look it up, it adds so much, yes. right? Yeah. And uh, yeah. and I actually, I have to admit, I do appreciate that there's a glossary at the end of my edition, so. I, it, um, me but, too, <laughs> but I, I hate glossaries. Yeah, I know. But <laughs> it, so I, I try. I read the whole book at first without using it at all. Yeah. But Ashok I did too, actually. Yeah, like the second yeah. time through, I looked. And I started looking things up. Yeah. yeah. Ashok Mather and, her, and I had a conversation. He's a, a Canadian writer. Yeah. Had a conversation about. Um, he was talking about readers who expect texts to be penetrable, mm -hmm. who sort of uh, assume that the text has to sort of lay itself bare for them, um, and the difference between that and, and sort of going with what you have on the page. And I had way more fun with uh, phone people just going with what was on the page. And then afterwards, if I wanted yeah. to explore more, I did. Right. What uh, was that little bit there that I missed? There's a there's another example of this. And Dorothy Sayers, I don't know whether you've, you know, so in the, at the end of this trilogy, um, big climactic romance she the character writes a letter to her uncle in France and he writes back to her and so now there's this long letter in French that is central to what's happening and the decision she's about to make and and I think Sayers just assumes that anyone reading her novel at that in that era in the 19th century you know early 20th century would uh, would of course also speak fluent yes. French yes. and I first encountered the book when I was 12 or 13 in the library in New Britain, Connecticut, and I was like, there was no Google. I had no way to access the English, and it was deeply, deeply frustrating. <laughs> I was like, what did he say to change her mind? I, you know? What little I know of Dorothy Sayer, I suspect that she actually didn't care whether you spoke French or not. <laughs> Maybe not. But yeah, and maybe that's the way to go, right? That yeah. that that letter needed to be in French, and yes. so it was in French. Yes. Yeah. So we are sadly uh, running out of time. I could talk to you forever, but um, I'll ask you maybe for one thing. I, I do think it's laziness, maybe for me. I mean, maybe that's not the right word, but like the approaching language on the sentence level with this kind of care, I find challenging. Mm -hmm. I find it, and I wonder if. What, what would you say to a student who's like, you know, handing you something and you're like, ah, oh, the language is, could be better, right? Mm -hmm. Like, are there any tips, any suggestions you give to get into the work in a better way? And you mean someone who's trying to write in vernacular or just struggling with language in general? Maybe struggling with language in general, yeah. I think the, to, to sort of get themselves to slow down and... Mm -hmm. uh, I have them uh, practice writing dialogue. Uh, and writing it without, I, I remind them that nobody's seen what they're putting on the page. Okay. They can always decide, no, I'm never going to show this to anyone. So there's nothing stopping them from just playing. Yeah. Um, and writing is experimentation. I mean, in academia, they call it research. Mm -hmm. And it's not that you have to go look things up, it's that the writing is the research. Uh, and the only way to do research is to, is to put things together and see what goes boom. <laughs> I think that ties into a whole other conversation about perfectionism and uh, and revision, which yes. maybe so we'll have to just come back and, and do this again. So um, I want to thank you so much, thank Nala you. Hopkinson. And um, if you could just tell everyone what are you working on now or what you'd like to point people to of yours that they should take a look at. Um, my second short story collection, Falling in Love with Hominids, came out a few years ago. But right now I'm actually learning how to write comics by writing for one of the most popular comics um, franchises in the world, The Sandman, uh, which is uh, rebooted with The New House in the Dreaming, and I am writing that story. That's amazing. So I, I have just bought my copy. I'm super excited to read the new graphic novel thank of you. The Sandman as interpreted by Nalo Hopkinson. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.